Good Friday morning of uh, the first week of Ordinary Time, okay? And again, we're, in, we're still with St. Mark. However, we're in chapter two now, okay? But listen, this is a great story. This one here, I'm going to give you a homily from a homily. It's one that I heard 60 years ago, okay? When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it became known that he was at home. Many gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door. And he preached the word to them. You could think of the early church. They were coming in. They were coming in. They came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Always paralysis. It's more than physical. It means somebody who, who cannot come by themselves. In a sense, somebody who's locked in their sinfulness or locked in habits, whatever, whatever, but their pals are carrying them. Think about that. See? They were, bringing him, they were bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, unable, this great thing, unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd. They opened up the roof above him. After they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, child, your sins are forgiven. Their faith, he forgives them. He forgives the paralytic his sins. You see that? Said, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes are sitting there asking themselves, why does this man speak that way? It's blaspheming. But who, who but, but God alone can forgive sins? Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking. So he said, why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easy to say to the paralytic. Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, pick up your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once and went, out, and went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astounded, glorified God saying, we've never seen anything like this before. <laughs> That's a great text. See? You know what I remember? Let me just give you this. I don't know how it applies, but I, I, this is very similar to all the other texts we've been looking at. But I remember... In the summer of 63, it was my first summer after vows. I took my vows in August of 62. This was in June or July of 63. My class and I and other classes, we went for two weeks at Shelter Island, our house in Shelter Island. We went for vacation there, our monastery house. It's not a monastery, but yeah, whatever you want to call it, on Shelter Island, okay? And we had daily mass, and not that can't be this is this text, but I don't know why it would have been in the summertime at that time. Although this is pre-Vatican II, so it's the old church. So I don't know, okay? But whatever, the old liturgy, okay? The 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 preacher was Father John Gresser. Now John Father Father John Gresser taught Greek and Latin in our seminary. And he made the homilies center around them, opening the roof and lowering them down. And apparently in Greek, okay? He knew Greek. I don't know any Greek. It's Greek to me. But the, I think, as I re, remember, I'm talking 61 years ago, 60, almost 61 years ago. What I remember was, and I think I remember him saying that this was the same language used for the resurrection. Christ breaks out of the, instead of, you know, Christ breaks out of the tomb. See, I think it may be the same words, used the similar words. Whatever the homily was, it, it, what a linguistic what a linguist would be dealing with, it was the interesting thing about the language. See, imagine I can remember it 60 years ago. Can't remember the details, but I can remember him saying, how about the Greek? Not the exact words, but about it. Yeah. See, isn't it funny how things will... I don't remember how the homily I heard in those, all the years of the seminary, but I remember that one. Isn't that something? As I read this, I think of John Gressler, and I think of my fellow passionists. And I think of so many who, in many ways, broke through the roof of my stupidity and scrupulos scrupulosity, and, and in a way redeemed me from myself. They had to break through the roof. I was stubborn in my in my pieties. I was stubborn in many ways in my scruples. 
I was paralyzed by it in so many ways, and the order freed me. In many ways, I had to break through the roof. Not too difficult, either, actually. See, because they were friends, the monks loved me my way. They loved me as I am. They took me as I was, and they saw in me what could be, what should be. And they loved me into my own freedom. And that was my classmates, my teachers, the monks. When I think of my life that I have lived and the flourishing of my life, it's inexplicable apart from the order. It's inexplicable apart from the order. They loved me in such a way that I saw who I was and what I was. And they sprung me loose. I began to believe in myself. And the paralytic gets up and carries his mat. The mat that I carried was my intelligence. I never knew I was anything at all. I was the dummy in my, the gang I hung around with. I was certainly not the brightest, not even close. And I turned out to have the most stellar career, professionally speaking, in terms of academic world. Who would ever thought Ray Vitale, Ray Theodore Vitale was gonna be a college professor, let alone a leader. I chaired 28 years at the philosophy department at SLU and nine years at Bellum. And I led some of the best scholars in the world. And I was in company with them. Okay. Who would have thought it? I remember my friends were kidding me not too long, a couple of years ago, and said, Gene, they couldn't quite say it. How'd you ever get here? You were so, and they couldn't put the words together without insulting and hurting my feelings. I said, I did it for them. I said, yeah, I was a dummy in the group. I, I said, the order saved me. <laughs> yeah, they, they, you had to know it. You had to say it. The only thing I'm sad about is in that same story is that I wish that my friends, Al and Barb, that their dad, Guido, could have seen what I made of myself academically, because I know he was a, such an academic in his own way. He was so brilliant, and he so expected it, and I was so dumb at that time and pious. And he was a religious man, but not a pious man, and I wanted him to know, Mr. Castanelli, I did it. Look what I became. Can you believe it? Look what I began. He died long before I completed my PhD. That's the only sad thing I felt. I wish Mr. A. Guido, if that he could have seen what I made of myself. That's something. When I see some of these texts, I remember years ago, 60 years ago, John Gresser preaching about, using the Greek language, preaching about these guys, cutting through the roof bringing redemption to their friend who was paralyzed, bringing them to Christ. And I think about him, and I think about who brought me to Christ. Not the pieties of my youth, but the depth of my faith, my fellow passionists, men who loved me and saw in me something beautiful and good and true, and they cultivated it. That's redemption. They took someone who was paralyzed in a sense, by piety and self-doubt, it made me confident and self-assured and intellectually bright. That's the order. They gave me my intellectual legs, my spiritual legs, and they gave me a heart to believe in myself and to pass it on, just the way these guys passed on, the paralytic that I preach the gospel of redemption because I sense so strongly my own redemption through the love of the monks in the monastery, my family, my friends, the parishioners. We redeem each other. In a sense, we tear open the roof and one way or another, we bring each other to Christ, often on a platter, sometimes on a gurney, but we do bring them there and hopefully we do it well. Well, as long as we do it from our hearts, we have bring them to Christ very well indeed.